Hey everybody, how's it going? As always, let me know how the audio is. For example, if I forget to turn my mic on, that kind of thing. Uh, or if the music's too loud. Welcome to episode 8 of Building a Game from Scratch. Uh, this is Building a Game in Game Maker Studio 2. And all of the source code is available via... Ooh, volume's a tad low. Oh. <laughs> Hold on, Jeff. Let me fix that real quick. Don't worry. We'll trim this part out of the VOD. Okay, you're good now. <sighs> on screen chat, not on screen. My God. Nothing is working. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Give me a minute here. Let's work let's work out these technical kinks before we get started. We'll just get started, and maybe I'll maybe I'll reboot the stream or something uh, after a while. Once stream jar starts to function again. Okay. Anyways, let's do this. All right, you guys. So uh, welcome to episode eight, uh, building a game from scratch using Game Maker Studio Two. These are about two hour long videos, about two two and a half hour long streams, and. Um, the intent behind this is just is to have kind of a free form thing. We're building a game from scratch, make the source code available so that anybody who is watching this and wants to learn about this kind of stuff can just take uh, take the code and use it in their own projects or take the ideas and use those in their projects. Um, so originally we were kind of being pretty free form about it where you know, we didn't really have much of a plan, much of an idea of what the game was gonna be. And over the past seven episodes, we have just started implementing features, just kind of willy-nilly to see see what we come up with. And where we've landed is we've got this um, this game where, well, I don't know if I, I wouldn't call it a game yet. We have this interactive experience where you can walk around. Uh, we have randomly generated areas. Um, we have these kind of weird f tongue flowers. Um, this this charge attack that you can activate by pressing Q, which currently all it does is just make these flowers disappear to, to no benefit or detriment to yourself or anyone else. Um, we also have multiplayer, so we have controller support. So let me turn these controllers on. So we have any number of players. I think we set it up to like eight or something, as well as camera control for that kind of stuff. So you can see if I scoot out, then we kind of have this Smash Bros. style camera zoom sort of thing. Um, so we've got a whole bunch of, we basically have like a mishmash of features. Oh, we also have a virtual joystick. And, and kind of up to this point, the idea has been to just kind of show how some of these systems get put together. But a moment to discuss how to implement a replay system in Game Maker would be beneficial. Oh yeah, that's... Almost too specific. Uh, it's sort of a replay system would be completely contingent on the the game itself and like how the game functions. Um, so we might do a replay system in this game, but we would have to actually. That's something I would I would do like last, uh, very last, because uh, once you have a replay system, 
in your game, then implementing it or implementing any new feature means every new feature has to be integrated into the replay system so that you don't miss things. And so um, you, you got to be pretty careful about that kind of stuff. Uh, order of operations. So, so what I think I'd like to do uh, this time around for this stream is actually take some time to kind of take stock of where we're at in the game's development and uh, and then kind of plan out where we're going to go. So uh, King Javo asks, what does a replay system entail? So essentially, like it kind of depends on the game, but I, I would say it essentially entails recording uh, states of things associated with timestamps and then being able to sort of puppet those things. So either you would sort of like replay the visuals of the thing or you would actually have every object in your game be able to be sort of like puppeted by the replay system so that they're no longer making decisions about what to do. Instead, they're just being told what to do by your replay system based on timestamps that you kind of play through. Uh, so there's a lot of different ways you, you could do it, but that's kind of like the the basic idea behind it. Um, okay, so so last time, yeah, so last time we did this streamlined input channels, we added controller support, we got this virtual joystick, we added multiplayer, and we added this camera management stuff. Um, so let's, and, and also I'm, I'm taking this stream game planning text document and I'm putting this into the uh, GitHub project as well, so people can refer to that. So let's talk about the vision for this game. Um, so in our studio, we don't really do game design documents necessarily. We, we typically do a, head, a heavy uh, iterative style and we, we just kind of adhere to some kind of overarching vision of what kinds of things we want to accomplish in the game, uh, how the game should feel and the, the general sort of like theme behind the game. And this way of making games comes pretty strongly out of uh, game jams. So, uh, so let's let's kind of take a step back and think about what we want this game to be. So we have these kinds of plants. We have procedurally generated rooms. We've got a character who presumably is doing some kind of combat. Um, so let's think about what we can do with these sorts of things. So we have we have plants some, and, and we kind of talked early in the in the game's development about maybe doing some kind of like a gardening or farming focused thing uh, and we do have this character with overalls uh, we talked about maybe calling this game green thumb and having something to do with like collecting seeds um, descending or even ascending into different uh, areas to collect uh, farming resources. <laughs> uh, all right, so so what do we want to do with this? Um, we can also hey talk gibberish. Uh, descending, descending into different areas. We can fight enemies that are protecting resources we are trying to collect. Manage a farm during the day and defend it at night is the suggestion from Shamus. Ooh, we got a new follow, Tarsius, thank you. Um, so one option here, so the, the tricky part with having something that like you build and defend is that you end up with a scenario where essentially you can sort of like have the player's progress get kind of de get deleted basically. If they fail to defend the farm, what does it mean? Uh, then that means that their farm is destroyed. And if the farm is the core part of the gameplay loop, then now you've got a pretty hardcore kind of like almost permadeath or survival style mechanic. Um, so what, what about maybe the possibility of using the using the idea of growing a farm as sort of a, uh, like the core gameplay loop. So 
or sorry, not, not the gameplay loop, but the core power loop. Uh, so I, I have given a talk on the idea of of loops, and the basic idea behind a loop is is you essentially perform an action in order to become better at that action in the future. And sort of like in Kerbal Space Program, this means you know launch your rocket, you get science points. Uh, you use the science points to research, and that gives you more rocket parts. Uh, so the more rocket parts allow you to build bigger, better rockets, take you farther, get even more science. In an RPG, a power loop would be defeat monsters, you get XP. Uh, the XP lets you level up. Leveling up lets you fight bigger monsters that give you more XP. And then you level up, get the XP. Now you can fight even bigger monsters, stuff like that. So uh, power loops are those kinds of things that, you know, your, your numbers get bigger. Uh, and, and you gain the game itself gives you more capabilities as you, as you progress. Um, and then, then there's also the concept of a skill loop, which is the game doesn't do anything for you. Uh, you just get better. So this is a uh, this is a sort of like a level head or a, like a skill based game, Super Meat Boy, that kind of thing, where your numbers aren't getting any bigger. Uh, as you as you progress through the game, you just learn new ways to play the game, and that allows you to overcome things uh, that you couldn't do before. So, uh, so this game is if if this game has combat, then then there's going to be sort of like a mixture probably of power loop and skill loop. Um, and if if you ever played a game that really kind of like just grabbed a hold of you, then chances are that it had a pretty good mix of of power loops and skill loops. Uh, these are the things that let you come back to the game and kind of like feel like you have a reason to keep going because you feel like you're going to improve in some way. So um, so one option for the, for the power loop would be something like um, you get uh, seeds and farming materials from fighting, then you... Uh, farm with those materials. Turn those materials into things that let you fight better. Yeah, typically uh, like a, a hobby AAA game, yeah, like Warframe or something, is is uh, it's just it's just a loop fest, loops, loops, loops. Uh, although a lot of modern games now rely on skill loops plus gambling, you know, that kind of thing. Farm Hunter World, yes. <laughs> Alright, let's see if StreamJar is working. I think it might be. All right, so so in this case, we're, we're basically saying the idea is like you're going to these sort of exotic locales. Maybe you're like teleporting to alien places or whatever, and there's all kinds of weird uh, plants around that you want to get materials from. And you can uh, chop those plants. You can do stuff to them. You're going to get maybe seeds or other materials. Uh, which also kind of implies that maybe there's a crafting system. Like maybe you bring that stuff back up to your farm and then you can, you know, turn stuff into other stuff. So there's a lot we can do with this. Uh, definitely at its core, this concept is really content heavy, which means, um, so if you think about a game, a crafting game, or maybe like even just think about uh, Crashlands. In Crashlands, in order to have one tier of armor, you know, we need enemies to fight, we need resources in the world, we need spawn rates, we need the crafting system to exist, we need the recipes, and it turns out that we need, you know, maybe 50 art assets for one tier. And so by the time we get to the end of the tundra in Crashlands, um, we have something like a thousand unique items in the game between components and armor and base items and stuff like that. So. Uh, that's okay. Uh, it's definitely a, a big undertaking if you're making a game by yourself. Uh, 
we could probably just try to do it anyway and just see see where it goes because uh, who cares the whole point of this is to just experiment so, so I think this is this is good um, so this is the the core idea behind the game here fighting and exploring farm with those materials uh, so that means essentially maybe we need like so we could we could take this in a few different directions um, one is we could start with the farm basically like your home base uh, and then give you ways to go out into these other places and then return back to your home base um, or we could start with the uh, combat so it might make the most sense to start with the farm so that we have kind of like our central place to uh, center ourselves mentally as we work through the design of the game. So, so let's do... Alright, so let's say actual plan. Let's build the farm hub. And then probably after that we want inventory system and uh, tongue flowers dropping things. Or no, next let's let's actually do like a full uh, design concept for the uh, combat. Because I'll, I'll also say right now our combat is really kind of weird. Uh, so you can click on things, but nothing happens. You. Uh, you can use a controller, but you can't use your 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 uh, cursor with the controller. So when you attack, it goes where the cursor is, but uh, that doesn't really. So you can't really like fully play the game with a controller. Um, and also, you only have one move that's on a cooldown, which is kind of clunky, right? So so we have a lot of work to do to kind of like revisit this idea of how you're going to be interacting with the game. So we can figure that out as well. Okay, uh, so we're going to say rough game design vision. Farm hub. Let's get this up here. This episode. All right. Okay, so we have this farm hub idea. Okay, so in our rooms we have the gameplay room. And we have our gameplay controller, which right now is generating a stage. Uh, so one option here is we could just set a, a global variable for whether or not we're just like at the farm. Um, so let's do that. So I wanna, I want the game to have like higher levels as you progress, um, but I also want different locations. So uh, let's see, global bar. Let's say current stage level. Uh, we can just say that if you are, actually no, current location, location uh, dot farm. So we can we can initialize our locations, and then we'll just use this current location variable to determine how we're going to generate the stage. Gameplay. Init locations. Can you guys read that text all right? I can blow that up. Enum locations. All right, I'm probably going to implement this real quick and then maybe reboot the stream and see if we can get uh, see if we can get chat in there. All right, so locations, uh, farm. And let's, what's our first location? Let's say like underwater, space, maybe like a cave, and uh, I don't know, that, that'll do. Those are the three places you typically would go if you wanted uh, 
seeds, right? So, locations. All right, so this is our current location, and in our gameplay object, gameplay controller, we would generate stage. Uh, so we'll say switch current location. With the farm, we'll do something, and. If we are not at the farm, we'll do something else. I'm using I'm using a switch statement here because it's probably going to be the case that we'll have some different um, we'll have some different uh, stage generation methods for the different locations. So okay, so we'll say generate location farm. So when we generate stages, what are we doing here? We are uh, creating stage rooms. We've got room centers. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and for now I'm going to duplicate generate stage and I'm going to call this generate farm. Okay, uh, clear world tiles. That's all good. So let's just look back through our world gener our stage generation here. Um, let's see, we have update terrain types for edges. So we have a bunch of things happening in generate stage that probably should just be their own thing. So update terrain edges. shrink this down a little bit okay so for example we have this region here that says update terrain types for edges um, so that means in this region this is just we're doing this one specific kind of thing and we're probably going to do this kind of thing a lot so i'll just cut this out uh, update terrain edges so this is now and you notice that because every every uh variable name is this light blue that means these are our uh, local variables and so we have no references to anything outside of this script other than globals, which means this is already fine. So uh, let's see, generate stage, update terrain types for edges. So now we'll just do this. Okay, so that's one thing. Spawn terrain visuals is what this would be. So that should all work as well. Um, so we can we can change what these sprites are depending on different locations or biomes or things like that. Uh, but having this all in one script means it's going to be a lot more accessible. So right, let's go back to generate stage. Okay. Spawn the visuals, what we just did. And then we have spawn objects in the world. So this is going to be based on uh, randomness. So we'll say spawn stage random objects. Okay, so that's all good as well. So you can see how all of these unique functions were uh, hard coded in this one script, in this uh, generate stage script. But chances are we're gonna need edge calculation, visuals, and maybe even random objects um, in a variety of scenarios, such as when we have our farm. Um, so now I've just broken these three chunks out into their own scripts, and then we can start to use them elsewhere without uh, repeating ourselves. So let's go to generate farm. 
So I'm actually gonna just delete this generate farm and we'll start over. Generate stage. Generate farm, okay. So notice how now this is a lot cleaner. So in generate farm, we have uh, ch -ch -ch, update terrain edges. Let me close this all down. Okay, so we have uh, locations of the rooms being established, which is what we were doing when we generated a stage. Uh, but we don't probably need any of those kinds of things for the farm, but we will need these things down below. Um, so it looks also like my syntax highlighting has stopped working. Hmm. All right, you guys, tell you what. Since chat isn't working and neither is syntax highlighting, I'm going to reboot the stream, reboot GMS. I'll be back in one minute. Try to get this thing going. All right, be right back. Think we're back? There we go. All right, you guys. Hopefully, chat's working. I don't know. I'm not responsible for these tools, you know. Okay, so back to the basics here. So we are trying to testing chat. Is it going? Is it going? Bummer. Oh, it's so much better with chat on screen. Sorry, guys. Maybe next time. This happened a while back as well. Okay, so we are working on spawning this farm. Um, so this is the room generation code for the original, uh, the original thing. So we just said generate stage room with the radius, all that stuff. So probably what I'm going to do in the farm is I'm just going to generate one room at zero, zero with a radius of like 20 or something. It's not going to be any bridges. It's just going to be one super big room with no randomness to it. Okay, so that's the first thing. Let's let's just boot that up and see what happens. <laughs> Nothing. That's because we didn't actually generate the farm. Okay, so we have this giant area. Seems like enough space to start a family. All right, so we also have these uh, tongue flowers being generated on the farm, which may maybe we want? I don't know. Probably not. Let's not do that for now. Generate farm. Uh, so we are going to not spawn random objects. And then the next thing we want is a way to leave the farm. Um, so I'm going to make. So how how do we want to manage this? So when you leave the farm, how do you do it? Um, and do we do we want the uh, so you can go to these different areas? One option would be to kind of treat these as a run, which is like if you go to space, you're going to start like at the beginning of space, and you're going to go as far as you can until you get defeated or something, um, and then you kind of like wake back up at your farm with all the the goodies that you got. Um, I think that'll probably be fine. So let's do it that way. Uh, so let's go to our Inkscape. 
let's say, okay, so we want to make uh, three different warp pads. And these are going to take us to space. All right, so this is the uh, size of a grid space here. So these are going to take us to space, underwater, and a cave. So I'm going to make... Make this warp pad here, and it can just be the same size as, as this grid space. Roughly. It'll, it'll spill over, but width and height wise. Okay, um, so we're gonna, let's see, stroke. Put this at like two. So I wanna give this thing a feeling of depth, so uh, we're gonna. Starters make it solid. There we go. Same thing here. All right, so we'll go kind of like a little bit darker. And then if you do this kind of thing, then it kind of feels like, you know, like it's got a little bit more meat to it. Make it 3D. Ooh, you got to get to a warp hole. I like that. Let's add that. Uh, warp holes to deposit your stuff into to teleport it back. So that's a really good idea, Shamus, because uh, what that basically does is it, it creates that um, like one more room kind of feeling. So if so any amount of progress you make, now you're committed because now you want to get to the next warp hole so you can drop your stuff in there and send it back home. Um, those are the kinds of like little details that, that switch a game from being kind of interesting to super compelling. So keep them coming. All right, so this can be the space pad. And really we just want this thing to be look like it's kind of glowing. So uh, easy way to make a glow is just go white in the middle and then uh, we want some stroke on there. So uh, whatever, whatever color the thing is glowing, then you kind of put that around the edges and then you can just kind of blur that out. So we could also do an overlay. Actually, it's probably the best way to do it. Let's do an overlay. So let's, let's uh, make the central point some color. Okay. So we'll, we'll talk about how to do that. And then we could probably make some kind of a pattern on this thing. I could probably just make a pattern and then mirror it. That'd be the easiest thing to do. Okay, so I'm going to group these. I'm going to group and dupe as they say. Transform. Sorry, align. We're going to align these like this, then group them again, dupe them again, uh, flip them, move them down, align them horizontally. We'll group that. Oops. Those. Then we can align the whole thing with this. Boop, boop. And then we can make this thing colored in some way. Okay, so we got like a warp pad. And then maybe I'll just kind of like put a like a white hot core in the cent in the center. Like that. Okay, so this is our space warp pad. 
And we could maybe throw a little bit of a shading on there. Not shading, but just something to kind of like make it a little more interesting looking like this. Something like that, okay. So this will take us to space and I'm going to put a bounding box in this. So what we'll do is we'll make a complete asset for, for the space teleporter. Um, and then we can duplicate that asset and recolor it for the other uh, locations. So, so we'll copy this over and now we want some kind of a glowing overlay, which we should be able to do by uh, let's see, so we can grab this and do like an aqua blue. Kind of blur that out and I want to also duplicate this or I'll just steal it, we'll blur that. Thicken the stroke and we want this to have, so I think we talked about additive blending in an earlier episode, but the idea here is we want to, we want to pull up the color channels a bit um, so that the, the additive blending actually does some work. So we'll do this, I'm going to delete this, okay. And the middle is already pretty good because it's already glowing. And what we're gonna do is we have this thing kind of like pulsing with a with a sine wave. So we want this whole thing to feel like it's glowing. Stroke style. Do, do, do. Can make this a little bigger. Bigger and blurrier. Okay, and I feel like this thing, this color here is a little bit maybe a little bit too bright, maybe. Because we're doing additive blending here, which just means anything we add is going to make this thing brighter. So let's try it. Also, I don't know if you noticed, but there's this little nub sticking out here. Gotta get that out of there. Okay, so this is gonna be our glow layer, which may be too much. We'll, we'll see how it feels. Um, so let's export these and then go from there. So we'll just kill the backdrop, export PNG, and we'll call this SP Warp Pad Space. That's 204 wide, 129 tall, which sounds right. So let's export that. And this one, we will export Warp Pad Space Glow. So we might have to play around with these glows a little bit to get them where we want. World. Uh, we can make a special group for the farm, because probably there's going to be some stuff in the farm that doesn't exist elsewhere in the world. Game dev stream game. We can switch the view to, yeah, this makes it a lot easier to import art assets. Did I not export the warp pad? I don't think I did. Warpad space.png. There we go. Didn't give it the right file type. Okay, so here is our warp pad. Let's actually get both of these. And this is the overlay, so you notice how this is just now exactly aligned inside the bounding box. And this is, it feels a little bit off because if you notice the center of the sprite is here underneath the glow, um, but we're kind of treating this thing as if it's raised up. So uh, this should still be okay in terms of placing it in the world. 
warp pad space. Let's make an object for this. Farm. Oh, warp pad. So I'm not going to make a space warp pad and a, a cave warp pad or any of those things. I'm just going to make one warp pad and it'll just change its visuals depending on where you go. Okay, we got this and this thing is going to be uh, have world element as its parent. And then in the draw event, it's going to draw image zero first, and then we're going to use additive blending and then have a sine wave come in. And we're also going to uh, say depth. Let's see, update world. Plus equals. Uh, so we want this thing to be walkable so you can, you can walk on top of it. Uh, which means it should be underneath shadows, maybe? Try it. equals shadow depth. Um, so we actually, should, we should probably initialize a new depth, which is the walkable depth. So this is the depth of things that go above terrain, but underneath shadows. So 45,000 is probably fine for that. And just for clarity, we can probably put that in between those. Uh, let's actually rename this walk depth, depth, walk over for items that you can walk over. Okay, uh, I got the warp pad, and let's just spawn the warp pad as is um, for now. So for the farm, we are now going to just create a warp pad. We'll create that at, uh, let's just create it at like position like one grid space over. So it should be just right next to us when we spawn. You normally create instances using layers or depths, and why? That's a great question. Um, so I would use layers on something where depths are not changing. And uh, so actually we did use in the terrain, we just have this terrain depth thing. So uh, for things that are being that are moving around a lot, you want to use depth because if you're doing this kind of downward view, then depth of things will be changing as they move because uh, something will go from being behind something to being in front of something. So layers are really good for uh, static, static types of things. So let's see, warp pad. So we could actually um, create... Uh, something like this. So terrain depth. Which actually this is probably more correct. Uh, let's see, walk over layer. Let's see where we're initializing the terrain layer, or world layer, I guess. We call that the terrain layer. I think that's probably more accurate. Ah, uh, 
rain layer. Okay. So we could probably put this in the same place in its stage generation. And the warp pad. Uh, so now we want to actually create this instance and just put it into a layer, right? So it doesn't even worry about its depth. Uh, the one issue here would be if we have walkover items that are moving around, then all of a sudden this whole thing kind of breaks because then they can move past each other and then they'll just kind of slide around. So this is, you know, what we could do it with layers first. And then if it turns out this can generate problems, then we might have to just do depth. So depth is going to be more computationally intensive. Layers are much faster. Um, so it's, there's always trade-offs. So we generate farm. Uh, instance create layer. So now this walkover depth. Uh, let's see. Layer destroy. Walkover layer. Since create layer, uh, we're going to create it at that original position. over layer and now we're going to make the warp pad in this layer so that would be another way to do it and also we are duplicating this code so i'm going to turn this into a script as well uh, let's see, reset stage layers I'll say create. Like this, and then we can say create stage layers. Just like that. So we make sure that we're doing that properly. When you use event inherited, does it matter where you put it, top or bottom? Yes, it will execute wherever you put it. So uh, if I went into this warp pad, if I said like, uh, so let's look at let's look at the inherited event here. So like width equals 30, height equals 30, for example. Um, so if I went in here and I said, you know, width equals 100, and then I call event inherited, well, the parent event is going to override what I just did. On the flip side, if I do this, then I'm getting the width from the parent, and then I'm setting it afterwards. So there is an order of operations there. So uh, same deal with if you run draw self, uh, then just whichever, wherever you put it in the order, then that's what's going to happen. So if you did, you know, image x scale equals two and then draw self um, then it would scale it up and then draw it if you drew it and then scaled it up then you would for one frame see it at at, uh, at the normal scale and then the next frame that would draw it would draw scaled up all right so we just did the layers so let's quickly test that see how that goes okay so we can walk on that thing that's all good Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So I want to now make this thing glow. Oh yeah. So looks like the depth of the layer I didn't set properly. Depth is walk over depth. Over depth is 45,000. Ah, it's because we actually have world elements changing their depth. So if we put it into a layer and then change the depth, that's not going to work. So actually, all of that stuff I just did is moot. Uh, so we'll just do instance create. We'll go back. Warp pad. Warp 
Yep. So we could use that walkover layer to spawn um, tiles and stuff like that. So we don't need to necessarily delete that layer, but that's okay. All right, so, so you may also notice that there's a little, it's kind of hard to see, but there's a little kind of a dark smudge in the middle of this thing. And that's because this thing is, is drawing a shadow. Um, so let's, you'll see it a lot better if I set the width and the height. So just let's do that so you can see it. Okay, so now the whole thing is dark. So we don't want that. Uh, so we are going to do shadow draw equals false. So in our world element, we have this shadow draw boolean, which the, uh, the shadow draw object will check to see whether it should use it to draw a shadow underneath the object, or in this case, on top of the object. Okay, so now there's no darkness on this thing. Now we can step on it. Uh, so let's get the glow in there. So normally what you do here is you'd say GPU set uh, blend mode. Actually, I'm gonna first. I'm just gonna draw the thing on top so you can kind of see what's what it's doing. Uh, so I'm gonna draw the glow layer, which is this layer. And we're going to say the alpha equals uh, sign. I think, do we have like a world time update? Yeah, game seconds passed. So we'll say sign of game seconds passed. Um, and if we do 0 0.5 plus 0 0.5 times the sign, that means it'll go from, it'll go from zero to one. Uh, Cause sign will give you values from negative one to one. So we chop that in half and then add a half to it. Then we'll, we'll have this alpha kind of going up and down. So this will allow us to test it. Now this isn't going to look like a glow. It's just going to look like a weird kind of dark thing, like popping in and out of existence. I guess it kind of looks like a glow, but uh, not in a way that we necessarily want. Ooh. Okay. So we want this to be a glow. So we're going to do additive color blending. GPU set blend mode, BM add. So this tells the uh, GPU, hey, you're about to draw something. And when you draw that thing, you're going to render the, the pixel colors additively instead of as an overlay. Uh, so now instead of this glow just being drawn, it's going to be drawn with the colors added to the colors beneath. Okay, so notice how super bright that is. Um, so it's probably even too bright, I would say. So what I'd like to do is take this central piece here and just really knock it down. Like I, I'd like the central piece to be super subtle. So that it just feels like it's just getting, you know, it's just getting brighter. Um, but I really want the attention to be on uh, on the, the line work and then the middle piece. So let's export this. Oops, we got to get rid of that backdrop. Add frame. So now we want and I never import uh, import stuff by hand normally. Okay, so here's the new one. This kind of feels weird, right? Because like this is supposed to be a glow, but it's dark. Um, 
but that's where the magic of additive color blending comes in. So let's see how that looks. Okay, so now you can kind of see it coming in and out. All right, looks like my glowy warp pad just earned me a follow. Nailed it. Okay, uh, so we are going to now make some color variations here. And also, looks like we accidentally removed the bounding box. Piece of cake, boom. Fixed. All right, so let's do the other warp pads. So we want to do cave and space. Uh, so the space one, I guess, would be, you know, yellow. Because the sun is out there. Know what I mean? So maybe like a... You can't really do dark orange, and that just kind of turns brown. But maybe like a deep. This is like a kind of ketchup and mustard vibe. Inkscape versus Photoshop? Uh, well, they're, they're just completely different tools for different jobs, so. Kind of depends on what you're going for. It's so like with Inkscape, I think what, what makes it nice is the flexibility of it. Um, one of the cool things you can even do is, let me see if I can do this properly. All right, so I'm gonna group this, okay? Take this spray can. Okay, and then I can do this. So now I've, I've created like duplicates of this thing, except they're not duplicates. They're, they're like clones or something, right? So I can like do <laughs> uh, weird stuff like that. So uh, what makes that really useful is when we're doing a lot of sprite animations. So for example, in, in level head, we have GR 18 has a lot of different poses and we want to uh, maybe like apply a power up. So, so we actually have GR 18 broken up into lots of different parts. Sam calls it a clone army because these are referred to as clones. So we make a clone army out of all the different parts of the character and then instead of having to update the visuals on every single pose of the hand, for example, um, you just update it once and then it cascades out across all the different frames. So really nice stuff. I feel like the, sp wait, this one's the underwater one, right? I feel like we should change the base color of this. Oops. Bill, uh, I think it should be like, a Like kind of a purplish, maybe? But not, not like ridiculously purple, just kind of like a... Like it has a secret about that it secretly likes purple. How do you select the parts? Just click on them. 
If you're having a hard time selecting things, you can also use this uh, node tool. And when you mouse over stuff, you can actually see like the, the, the different areas. Yeah, so in Inkscape, things are, like you can use layers, but really it's actually just a collection of objects. So, uh, so all of these, e each of these is a unique object, and then you can manipulate that object by itself. So, uh, so you can even do something like this. And you can take take a word, and I can pick whatever font I want. And maybe I want this goofy font. And normally, like an image manipulation program, if you wanted to do something more interesting with this, um, you'd have to apply filters or those kinds of things. Um, but with this, you can just apply strokes to things, or I could like, I could even, uh, I could duplicate it. So now I've got two of them. I can apply a stroke to one of them, like this. Really fatten that stroke up, and then throw it behind. So now I've got like a thick outline uh, for this thing, which is really just two words on top of each other. Uh, then you can do even more interesting stuff. Like you can say uh, path object to path, which now has converted the text into a series of nodes that can be manipulated. So you can do whatever you want with that. Um, and you can also do lots of cool things like intersections. So, so I can take this whole thing, I can group it back together so that it's a single object again. And then I can be like, I want like a cool slice through this thing. So I'll just do this. I can color this. If I duplicate the hello, select both of them, and then I can make an intersection, uh, which you would do by, let's see, object, uh, oh crap, I don't even know where it is. All I know is the hotkey, which is control asterisk. Okay, so now I have these two things going on here. Uh, there's just a lot of really cool stuff you can do with vectors that, and I, like, I'm confident that you could do any of these things in Photoshop in the sense that like, you could get this same outcome without without a huge amount of struggle. Um, but Vector does make it really slick and fast and, and pretty easy to uh, to work with, so. Okay, uh, do you, so let's get our warp pads finished here. So this is our uh, cave thing. I think this one's underwater. All right, sorry, this one's space. And we want space to have this kind of gray border because it's like it's metal, I guess. Um, so let's get the glowing set up on this. Shouldn't be too much, just a little bit. And we want to bring up the red channel so that this thing becomes a little more white. So this is kind of weird, like it looks kind of brown, but I think it'll still turn out good. Um, and what was our last one? We have, we have cave. Um, so the cave can be, I don't know, like green maybe. All right, we just think about this purple. I think we should just keep the bases all the same now that I'm looking at it. bring that back okay so let's do a green thing like a deep green Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, Inkscape is free. It's open source. Yeah. <laughs> yep. So 
So we want to fill this in with, we want to give this, yeah, we'll try that. And then this color we want to steal from here. And then we want to just add some red in there so that we bring up the color channels more. Okay. And we can just try that. So, so these are our three different portals. Selection. So actually the first one is underwater. This one is space. So I'll re-export the first one with the right name. Or pad underwater glow. Where'd we go? Okay. Hey, Ronan Krang, welcome. Uh, these are warp pads that will take you to different regions of the game. Also, you didn't miss much uh, earlier because the whole. Uh, Stream was exploding. Chat's not working. Game Maker exploded. It's been a lot. It's been a it's been a technical difficulty extravaganza. All right, so I'm gonna open up this warp pad, and we're gonna just take all these, just like that. Underwater space cave. Okay, so I'm just gonna put these in the same order that they appear in there, just for ease of use. Warp pad. Destination equals location dot underwater. Okay. Um, I'm gonna do something a little bit weird, but it's okay. Set up item information after spawn. Switch location. So we're gonna call this image offset. I'm gonna use the location or the destination of the warp pad to change what it looks like. So uh, switch destination. Space farm and underwater. Okay. What am I doing here? Not farm dot. Okay. So if we are underwater. Image offset equals zero if we are in the cave. So this is what we're going to add to the sub image. So zero, one, two, three, four for the cave and two for space. <clears throat> Just like this. And then when we do our draw, we're going to draw image offset, image offset plus one. Uh, so when we spawn these, we can run the user event zero. Um, another option here is you can even just do like alarm zero equals one, which means uh, at the start of their step, the alarm will go to zero. So you can do all kinds of stuff in the create event and then uh, it'll pop back over. So.
So instead of user event zero, we can change it to alarm zero. Generate farm. Uh, let's see, warp pad center X. All right, so we can do a with right on the instance create. We say destination equals location dot space. So one of them will go to space. Uh, one of them will go to uh, the cave. And one will go to underwater. So one will maybe go like to the left and then one will go down like this. So We'll start with this and we'll see how that looks. Okay, so we have our three glowing portals, which I think are doing pretty good work. Uh, we may want to, right now you notice how they're in sync with each other. The one thing here is we can even do something like just to give them some randomness. Um, oops, destination. We can just add something specific to it to the timer. And we can also um, speed the timer up so that they're a little bit more noticeable. Okay, so now they've got, instead of being totally synced up with each other, they just kind of feel a little bit more, a little bit more lively. And I suppose we also want some kind of badass particles kind of coming off of these things. So let's, let's do that. And then that, that'll be good for those. Oh, and they need to shoot a glow out naturally. All right. Ever know that I hit the uh, desktop button and then it flips over to a new desktop and I always forget those hotkeys. Anyways. All right, let's get these particles going. I think we made particles earlier. Use this PTM. Okay, so we did make the particle manager. So I'm going to steal this. Let's pop over to the warp pad. Okay, so we have PTM setup, and then the cleanup will do PTM cleanup. And we are going to make some cool kind of like liney particles that kind of emerge off of the warp pad. So we'll call this create type. So we'll just initialize some information about the particles and then we'll we'll iterate over those. Uh, let's see, line PT, 
and these can go I don't know. We'll just give them some information and then we'll go from there. Oops, life. But I usually have each object manage its own particle system, or is that just simplicity for the stream? No, I would not. Um, which we could, well, it depends. Uh, but normally we would have a particle manager object that would do automatic cleanup and stuff. Which we could, we could look into if you guys want to see something like building a particle manager. So that you can be confident that you are not uh, leaving particle systems behind and that kind of thing. Room speed. Okay, so do, do, do. let's just spawn these particles and see where we're at. Because there's something else here, which is we need colors. So for space particles, we want like blue, or I guess um, purple. Cave. I guess underwater is blue. Space is kind of yellow. So, and the cave is green. We also need the blending, which would be additive, which is true, and we need. Uh, alpha three, which means they will break their alpha into thirds over their lifetime. So it'll start at maximum alpha and then they'll fade away. Is there a tool in Illustrator that lets you grab a line and wiggle it? There is not. There has to be. That's, isn't that the whole thing with vectors? <laughs> grab a line and wiggle it. Ooh, yeah, we need to get the depth part system depth. Uh, so we want this to actually be uh, just at the Y, I suppose. All right, so I'm just going to sort of badly spawn these particles for now. And then we can go from there and kind of get them in the right spot. So line PS, line PT. Uh, the notice I'm just kind of giving these some randomness, but it's not actually randomness that means anything. I'm not basing this on the size of the object. I'm just getting the particles into the world. Then we'll, we'll get them adjusted. They always say measure twice, cut once. Alternatively, you can measure zero times and just cut randomly. Okay, so my lines are, you know, they're coming out of there. And that's good, except space one is the wrong color. That should be yellow. And they are, of course, sideways and too big. Part type orientation. Let's orient these lines. Part type size. Um, let's go like 0.3 to 0.5. So quite a bit smaller. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> okay, so this could work for us. I think we should probably actually start them at zero alpha as well. Maybe. We're getting there though. Um, so the space one, it's green and blue, should be red and green. Because uh, red and green make yellow. I mean, you guys know, right? Like, you ever mix red and green paint together? Boom, you got yellow paint, right? That's how that works. We've all been there. Mm, yeah. Yeah, it's definitely nice to have extra tools for managing particles and stuff. Okay, so what we want to do is figure out actually where these things should be emitting. So one thing you might notice here, if we go back, is that I based the size of our uh, warp pad on the size of the grid. So that means the aspect ratio is actually pretty close to the grid aspect ratio as well. So if I shrunk this down, and dropped it in here, you will see that the sides generally are pretty close, right? So we can actually use the grid size as a, as a way to determine um, where things should be spawning. So uh, first, let's take a look at the pixel size from center to the edge so we can figure out how wide this thing is. Or we'll just, we'll just get the width. That's also fine. OK, so that's 38, the x. And if we go to the middle, and we are at 102, so we're at like 64, right? 64 wide, or 64 radius. So if we said uh, in our warp pad, instead of random negative 30, if we did 64, then that would get us, oh, let's do this, uh, let's, no, no magic numbers here. Uh, center width, or center radius. Okay, and then for the Y, we can just take center radius times grid ratio, because that is the aspect ratio of the grid. So, unfortunately this is gonna give us so what this will actually do is this will give us a rectangle. So we're still not quite there. ANTW Games. I'm one of the early testers of the upcoming Game Maker Studio 3. If I was, I probably wouldn't be able to talk about that, would I? <laughs> it's all right. Uh, I am not, though, actually. At least for now. Okay, so I have these spawning in a rectangle. It still actually is kind of looking good, but you can see, if you look closely, you can see how they kind of feel like they're emerging from outside, kind of in these, in these like, corner areas. It would be super noticeable if I uh, didn't have them fading in. Um, so all I have to do here is particle spawn distance. Uh, random range from zero to center radius. Spawn direction equals from zero to 360. And then we'll do distance particle spawn direction. On the X and on the Y, we just multiply the outcome by the grid ratio. So we kind of shrink the Y down. Cut fast travel options and make the player run everywhere. Yeah. Also, I totally stole the X. Okay, and then I'm going to just pop these up by like 10 pixels, just so that they are 
because the lines actually are centered. Um, so even if I spawn them perfectly around the edge, they'll look like they're kind of coming out a little bit too low. Okay, so we have our warp pads. And then I suppose when the player is standing on one, it should, you know, like vibrate. Do something. So uh, let's let's do that. Do we have shake in here? No. Okay, we are going to add some shaking scripts here. Shake in it. And this is just a variable called shake. I think we did something like this for the camera, yeah. So this should be pretty familiar if you watched a while back. Um, so we, we want us to be able to have an easy way to make things vibrate. So uh, shake get, which is it's just a random number between negative shake and positive shake. And last we need shake update, which is a shake equals maximum zero, shake minus, I don't know, 20. Uh, slow mo seconds. So what we're gonna do here is we can initialize the shake and all the world elements, that way everything has the ability to shake. So you do that. Um, in the warp pad and the draw event, we will do shake update at the end. And x draw is going to be x plus shake get. Y draws me y plus shake get. Swap those out. And then we can just ask if the player is is uh, within range, if the player is standing in the same grid space as I am. Um, then, then we can start shaking. So, player is in, is standing on me. Long but descriptive variable name. If that green creature was made out of marzipan. <laughs> mm -hmm. Merchandising. I like it. All right, so we do, I believe, have a grid location. Right, world element. Grid pause. Yes. Does the player have a grid pause? does okay so that means so the way this will work is if you're using a with statement to reach into another instance then other will refer up one level to the the thing that initialized or that initiated the with statement. So uh, another way to think about this is like this warp pad equals ID. So you can also just do this, uh, which is probably the clearer way to do it. Have a good one, Ant W Games. Thanks for coming by the stream. Also, these videos are all up on uh, YouTube, so if you, anybody wants to go back and rewatch uh, old stuff to kind of get a sense of how we got to where we are, then you can feel free to do that. All right, so the player's standing, standing on me. Okay, and then we'll say, hey, if the player's uh, standing on me, then I'm gonna just shake a bit. Huh! Poor 
notepad.shake. Not said before reading it. Is that true? Shake in it. I read squish in it, and I... I read it as shake. Oh. Oh. Shake. Shake. Things are happening now. You know what we could do? We could do something even better. Player. The player can also shake. Right, right. And then they can both shake. Oh my god. Yeah, we're really we're warping now, folks. Here go, buddy. It's also a good foot massager. If you need. He's going to be running a lot, so. Looks like your dog when you give him a bath. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to commit this stuff and push it. There are warp pads in the farm area, and you can stand on them to vibrate. You can't stand on them to warp yet. Um, also, I'm pushing this out to the GitHub repo. The link is uh, underneath the Twitch stream, or if you're watching this on YouTube, it'll be under the video description. You can pull stuff down right as I push it. So if you do know how to use Git, then you can just boot this up right now as is. All right, uh, so next up, let's actually have this warp pad send you somewhere. Um, so we're just gonna say a warp timer equals zero. And if the player is standing on me, then the warp timer is gonna be incrementing. Question is how long should you have to stand on this thing? Uh, maybe just like, a second. Uh, there's a question of if you if you put the warp max time a little bit too short, then the player may try to like run across the warp thing and then just get teleported. Uh, so there's kind of a there's a middle ground there. Okay, so warp timer. Uh, we'll say if, if warp. Timer is going to be max time. Send the player to somewhere. And if the player is not standing, um, then we can just reset the timer. Equals destination. Start at level zero. Let's see if this works. So we should now be able to go from the farm to this place. So the transition is a little bit not great. <laughs> uh, and also, how do we get back? I don't know. These are questions for another time. Um, but they work. So, so we have the farm hub. Uh, there are warp pads on the farm that you can use to go places. So at the moment, every place is the same, right? So if we start over, I guess now we're we're just trapped here. 
So now we have to restart the whole game in order to go back to the farm. Okay, but we're making progress. Mint, you can warp from the farm to underwater? Yeah, Ronan Krang, there's a farm. Well, there's not a farm yet. We still need to figure out you know, the mechanics of that farm. All right, so, so we now have how you leave the farm. Okay. Uh, so let's see, warp, warp holes. All right, so it's we've got about 20-ish minutes. Can we make an inventory system in 20 minutes? I think we can. Let's do it. Inventory. So an inventory system is going to be a bit of heavy lifting, so this might be a bit of a quieter part of the stream as I just slap the crap out of the keyboard. It takes focus. Okay, so this inventory system, uh, first question is, presumably we're going to have multiple different places to put things in your inventory. So, uh, let's see. And I'm going to actually use a macro for this. So we're gonna have a player inventory. We're going to have, um, I guess like a, obviously we need a wallet. That's where currency goes. Uh, we're gonna need, probably your, I guess you like your farm bank. When you put stuff in the farm. Inventory items. Let's see. No, actually, before I start setting up data structures. So this is all about data management. So inventory information. We need to know What's the maximum number of uh, slots in an inventory? Um, what kinds of items can go into the inventory? We also actually need, need items. need to know like what types of items things are um, so you know like a currency we can have uh, seeds we know we're gonna have enemies plants probably weapons of some kind so you guys thanks for coming by the stream Tongue flower. Warp pad. Um, I'd say structure would be another kind of item. Okay, now I'm going to use macros to establish 
item IDs. Uh, we'll just say money. We'll call it farm bucks or something like that. Okay. So what we want to do is initialize some information about these items. Uh, let's see, type and then object. Okay, so these are the three things that we have at the moment. So I'm going to make a script called setup item. fast here so we can uh, try to get everything in okay so we're gonna initialize an item ID everything is gonna get a name everything's gonna get a type everything's gonna get an object so these are for items that can be spawned in the world all that stuff Name type object. Okay, and if we go back to init items, now here we'll say setup item. Name is going to be tongue flower. And we have warp pads, which is a structure. So I don't. We don't have anything tied to these item type classifications yet, um, but we probably will. Like for example, if we have a, we could, we could say what kinds of items can go into certain inventories. Uh, so we could say, for example, like structure items can't go in to anywhere. Um, seed items may go into like a special seed pouch or something like that. We may have like tool type items that do things. So it's basically just like, we don't really know what we're going to be doing necessarily later, but this gives us the room to start to stratify the data structures and get the items separated in their function. Warp pad. Okay. And money. Um, so for money, I'm just going to make an object called O pickup, which isn't going to do anything just yet. Uh, but the idea with a pickup would be you just touch it and you acquire it. So, which as we all know, that's how money works. So, looks like my dog is up and about. Give me the stare down. All right, we got our money. Let's go to, let's close all these things down. Give ourselves some breathing room. Inventory, okay, so here's what I'm thinking is you've got your own inventory, uh, which I guess would be like during that run Inventory has slots, inventory has Same kind of structure. Name. Uh, 
sluts and uh, allowed item types. <clears throat> Let's go back here and switch these back to macro. So the reason I'm using a macro is that it's not going to change. So it's not really much different than using an enum. Other than an enum, the the numbers can be dynamic. So now my dog is pouting on the floor. <laughs> Oh, life is so hard. All right, so uh, inventory info, inventory player. Uh, we could just call this one, This we'll just call it your inventory. That'll just be what people would think about as their inventory. Slots, uh, I don't know, 30. We'll see. None of this means anything yet. All right, now we want to So we have uh, allowed item types. So the question is, should this be a whitelist or a blacklist? Should we say what's allowed in an inventory? Probably. Inventory, or, uh, set up inventory. Name, slots, And then we can do some optional arguments that can go on forever. Uh, name and slots. Let's see. The chances are we'll get this inventory system programmed, but we won't be able to stitch all the game systems together to plug into the inventory during the stream. So that'll be next time. Inventory slots, and then let me say what kinds of items can go in here. Do add argument I to the list. Okay, so let's go back here. Now we can run our script. Thirty slots, uh, and then what can the player hold? Let's look at the item types. So it can hold seeds. Uh, maybe entire plants. Okay, so those are the things the player can hold in their inventory. Um, now we have the wallet, which is where your money is going to go. So only currency type items can go into your wallet. And. Your farm inventory, we'll call this, this is your barn or something. This is where you're just gonna keep, it's your silo. I don't know, you keep everything in there. Um, so we'll just say that if we have an empty, uh, an, an empty list for an inventory, then we'll just allow all things in there. Okay, so that is, 
part one, but we also need to actually um, create this inventory list. So, so the way it works in uh, Crashlands is your inventory actually has a, a few lists kind of like stacked on top of each other. So we have a list called items owned, which is a list of item IDs. We have um, your inventory, which is a list of uh, slots in the items owned list. Yeah, and then we have uh, we have item or inventory stacks list of stacks matches slots with items owned and so so the way this kind of works is that's <clears throat> yeah, gonna be a little bit kind of weird to wrap your brain around. So come on a journey with me. Okay, so let's say you pick up two items. Like you pick up uh, you pick up a wrench and you pick up uh, twenty coins. Okay. So I'm gonna write this out down here. So you pick up a wrench at 20 coins, then here's what this would look like. Okay, so these things are gonna they're gonna match right up. Uh, and if we don't have any special data for any of these, then we just have negative ones. Okay. So you've picked them up, and now your inventory list. Let's say. Let's say your inventory has like four slots. So now your inventory is gonna look like this. Uh, zero, one, negative one, negative one. the wrench is in the zero slot and the coins are in the one slot. Hey doggy, what are you doing? All right, so negative one uh, means we have nothing in that inventory slot. So now if we ever wanted to move the wrench to the last spot of our inventory, then we do this. We just trade so that now where the wrench was zero, it's this, and now the wrench is over here. Okay. So we haven't changed anything under the hood, under our items owned, or any of that stuff. We've just changed our inventory is just basically a list of like pointers that just point at things. So we're gonna put together a set of scripts to kind of handle all of this stuff. Um, so that means for every inventory, we want items owned, uh, stacks, and data. Although interestingly, stackable items probably don't have data because data is typically used for unique. So we can probably just merge this concept together. 
items owned. Like this. Okay, so let's do that. Uh, see inventory items owned. data and slots so for each of our inventories we're going to set up one of these systems Okay, so we have a list of items owned, list of item data, and item slots. And if we have, um, let's see, if we have an inventory that has a limited number of slots, meaning we give it some number here, um, then that means that means we can just pre-populate our slots. So. Say repeat. So we're gonna add a bunch of negative ones, which just means nothing. There's nothing in there. Or we can even go one better, which is we can have nothing be a type of item. Actually, let's make that negative one. Let's do that. But actually, this refers to a slot, so we're fine there. Okay. Crashlands is this flipped on its head because there's no limit on what you can hold. No, actually, this this uh, this is the Crashland system in the sense that um, when you when you pick up like a, a single piece of bacon weed, right? Then it would work like this, right? Where it's like, or let's say, yeah, let's just say bacon weed here, right? So you pick up twenty pieces of bacon weed, then this number now says twenty. If you pick up 50,000 more pieces of bacon weed, then this number just becomes 50,020. Um, so really, you know, we just, you just keep going with all of this. Um, and this, this list does get pretty long, but we kind of figured out that like, even if this list gets up to several thousand unique items owned, it doesn't really matter that much. Because really, like one of the big problems with inventory management is just the UI. And how do you give the player convenient ways to, to sort all these items and store them and, and all of that. Because the data itself is not that big in terms of what you're storing behind the scenes. So, uh, so in Crashlands, the big design challenge was coming up with ways to make the inventory context sensitive which is why like you go into your inventory you click on your helm slot and then we just iterate over this list find all the helms you have then you just see those helms um, or when you're picking up items that's when we update the count and show you or when you're looking at a recipe we show you how many of the types of items you have that make up the recipe and so you know, we do get the request all the time for people who say, like, I just want to be able to see all of the things that I have in Crashlands. Um, but without some kind of pretty sophisticated way to filter and sort those items to look at them, 
uh, you just end up with a huge pile of items, thousands of th and thousands of, of entries long. That would be very hard to parse. Because um, as soon as you can see all those, then you have that temptation of wanting to search in it and manage it and sort it and, and drag things around. And, and we just decided we're just not going to do any of that. So... Yeah, it's kind of it's, it's kind of an interesting challenge. Infinite in inventory means you don't want to see all of it. Is there some kind of limit on what you're describing? So you're describing a system where you store what you can afford. You can afford three warp pads, which means you have to have. Uh, yeah, you're probably you're probably overcomplicating. So. Start with the simplest possible case. Um, and then as your design expands, there may be holes in that implementation that you can either refactor or, or come up with some alternative. But uh, Okay, so we've kind of started setting up the inventory here. And let's do so in, in inventory and init items. Okay, so we've started to set up some structures that will allow us to more reasonably manage the items in the world as well as inventory. We don't have any scripts at all for actually like putting stuff into the inventory and all that. Um, so we'll have to get to that next time. So let me just commit what we have though. And actually before I push, I'm gonna run the thing and make sure I haven't introduce some kind of horrible bug. Okay, so we have the home base. Uh, we You can take your warp pad and we've started creating an inventory system. So next stream, we'll definitely have to dig deep into this inventory concept. And I think, I think what we'll try to do is get to a point where you can uh, charge through, uh, when you charge through a flower, we'll put that into your inventory so we can kind of see what that might look like. So, okay, uh, origin master, oops. So I'll do a little bit of editing on this uh, VOD for the YouTube clip because we had a few breaks and te technical issues. Um, so if you want to rewatch any parts of this, uh, it'll probably take till like the middle of the week before I get this video up on YouTube. So uh, anyways, thank you guys very much for coming. And so next time we'll work on inventory management and then start to actually dip into the combat probably in the collection stuff and, and get those refined. So uh, thank you guys very much for watching and we'll see you next time.